Welcome back to Rome Boys. On this episode, we welcome back a very special guest, Jesse Romero. Yes, don't even have to read his bio this time. Everybody knows you, and we've already said it once, so <laughs> bring the fire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's been about a year since we've seen you. Things did not turn out like we hoped and prayed they would. <laughs> in the election. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just yeah. in general. Yeah. Just everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the culture and the society and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Even makes- in California. I, I had big hopes for California the other day. That went down the, that went down the tubes. Hey, my question, though, just a minute ago to the guys here is, uh, how is it they, that they were able to count all the votes in like two hours? They, they did the same thing that they did with the national elections. They stole them. Right. The, de- <laughs> the, the Democrats have it figured out to a science. Uh, that's why, by the way, he, did you notice that uh, unelected Joe Biden didn't give the po- well, he's given the post office 600,000 employees. They don't have to take the vaccine. Uh, why but- is that? The book, the post office, they do the bidding for the Democrats. They dump tons of mail in ballots, you know, uh, uh, the next day, a week after the elections. And uh, there's a collusion there. And so Biden gave them a pass. They don't have to get the jab. Here's what's crazy. I just wow. went on to the APWU uh, website. Anybody can go on there right now. The uh, American Postal Workers Union. And I've worked with a union before. Uh, and uh, it was quite interesting how mafia like it was people might think i'm crazy for using that word but oh my gosh they got some persuasion let me tell you Mm. and if the apwu is posting it on their uh, website obviously in my opinion i immediately thought what does the union have on this administration Mm. because it's their workers right that was doing Mm. the bidding on the on the election yeah oh and by the way uh in senate and congress none of them have to get the jab either Mm. they get a pass so Mm. Uh, yep. For thee, but not for me, right? <laughs> so Joe Biden keeps calling himself a faithful Catholic. <laughs> what do you think? Um, yeah. Le- Joe, le- he, th- this is what's sad. Here's we got the second Catholic president in U.S. history, mm. and this guy is an apostate, mm. dissenter, modernist, yeah. uh, I mean, just lukewarm Catholic, and I was being nice. Those, those were nice descriptions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but I'm just being objective. I mean, this guy is a product of the last 60 years of malf- modern, malformation under the modernist in the Catholic Church. I mean, he. this is, you know, he's a classic Catholic that was brought up at St. Miscellaneous Church with balloons, banners, and butterflies where anything goes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. Gosh, it's so true. Yeah. You know, I find it kind of ironic. or if, It'd be funny if it wasn't so sad that, you know, here we are a year later, and all the things that these, I'm not even going to call them Democrats or liberals, these, these Trump haters <laughs> that didn't vote for him because they thought he was mean, and they call him, you know, a narcissist. They call him a Nazi. And that's exactly the way this administration is acting is Mm -hmm. four years ago or the last four years, they called him that. And now here we are with one that is actually that socialism, (laughs) communism. Mm -hmm. No, the the, the last speech that Biden unelected Joe Biden gave the other night when he when he scolded the entire nation. Yeah, that was a speech of a king. Mm, yes. somebody yeah. who could yeah. the monarch uh-huh yeah that, that, that he's not like what, do, what how do presidents usually say my fellow americans mm. that was not a my fellow that was i'm the king you're gonna do what i say yeah what? dictator in chief <laughs> yeah we're feeling it i mean it's uh you know i work in the nursing home world and we are working with uh, U.S. and state congressmen doing everything that we can to fight this just for simple, uh, the simple ir- irony of free medical choice. <laughs> Who would have thought we'd be arguing this, right? Like, mm. really? <laughs> my body, my choice. <laughs> That's yeah. right. We have to use their phrase. I mean, they've been using that since Roe versus Wade. Mm. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Goodness gracious, yes. But it only works one way. It only it only works in one direction. Only one direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It only works for them. Yeah. yeah. Only works for them. Uh, well, yeah. So it's uh, sorry. I feel like uh, what's his name, uh, Vice President Pence. I got a fly on my forehead. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I hadn't thought about that in a while. Or Saint John Vianney. Let's yeah. stay Catholic here. Let's. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, All right. Uh, so uh, back to uh, the church. Uh, so which bishops do you solidly trust now in our church, and who can we go to as far as uh, who's still speaking the truth? Very few. Yeah, yeah. I'll, just, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. I, I think there's okay. I've talked to a lot of bishops because I travel around the country. I give a lot of conferences and lectures around the country. I've been doing that for years, and I'm gone almost every weekend somewhere giving a lecture. Bishops will come and talk to me. We'll have personal conversations. And I can tell you, all of them tell me about one out of three is pretty much in line with the church's perennial teachings, orthodox, Mm. uh, and and solid and on board. But they tell me, they go, Jess, we're we're, we're, we're basically overrun at the USCCB. Mm. We're uh, we're outnumbered. And so about a third of the bishops are solid Orthodox bishops, but they have little to no voice mm. because you have the, you have the, you know, the, the homosexual promoting bishops, mm-hmm. Marxist promoting bishops, the, you know, put on your mask promoting bishops. They got the mics right now and they got the positions of authority. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's just the state of the church right now. Uh, but it, it does, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me because What's happened with a lot of our bishops is they've been infected by three M's. There's three M's that the devil is using to attack the church. Modernism, Marxism, mm. and Masonry. Hmm. Oh, and yeah. you'll, you'll find either either bishops have bought into wholesale modernism, liberation theology, Marxist theology, or they are friendly. They're, they're, they're socialist friendly. Uh or you know, they're into liberation theology, or some of them are even Masons. We know that because Bella Dodd told us in 1950, she says, I was sent over here to the U.S. to bring uh, communists into the seminaries, and right now, she says that right now we have a 1,000 uh, seminarians who are communists. This is in 1950, mm-hmm. and she said, and right now we've got four cardinals in Rome. This is in 1950 mm-hmm. that are communists that we brought through our seminaries into now into the Roman Curia. Wow. Our, our, our church is full of Marxists right now. I'm telling you right now. That's been a that's been the plan of, 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 of the devil through Joseph Stalin. We have the church has the documentation on that. A book was written on that. Ten books has another good book on that. It's called AA Anti Apostle 1025, which talks about the infiltration of communists in the seminaries. And there's also another good book. It's called by Michael Rose. He wrote it about 25 years ago, 20 years ago. It's called Goodbye, Good Men, where he talks about the infiltration of communist homosexuals and uh, Masons into the seminaries. Hmm. I mean, that's where we're at right now. Yeah. That's a great way, though, the Trojan horse effect, right? Just infiltrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. because Because the enemies of the church have tried to fight us. Mm-hmm. head on and, and they lose when we when we can identify arianism we can identify nestorianism islam uh you know the protestant reformation uh you know the the revolts of the kings of england the french revolution the Cristero wars we could see who our enemy was yeah this enemy is is now like a cancer it came into the church and it's starting to infect the mystical body of Christ. You don't know who is a modernist Marxist until they open their mouth. Like yeah. Father James Martin, he yeah. said, okay, I know, I know what team he's on. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And it's interesting, you said two-thirds of the bishops, you know, Arianism, during that time, two-thirds of the bishops believed in Arianism, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, so, so you're Pope. Let's say you were elected Pope tomorrow. What would you do? What would you change? What would be your mission? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, you got 30 minutes, go. Uh, okay. <laughs> Canon 915 would yeah. be used uh, ah. generously. Yes. Huh. Excommunications need to be used. Why? Not to punish people. It's medicinal. To wake it's them to up. Restore, it's to restore people back into the good graces of God so they can get to heaven. 
I would the first thing that I would attack would be modernism in the schools, in the chanceries, and modernist theologians. Mm -hmm. And I would get rid of them. I would say, bye, see them. Here's your uh, you know, uh yeah. your retirement. I, I would get rid of them or mm -hmm. canon nine fifteen them. <laughs> uh modernism, because Pope Pius X warned us that modernism is the synthesis of all heresies. This is the worst thing that we can be dealing dealing with. Wow. And that's what I would do if, if I was a pope. I would go after, not the Latin mass, I would go after <laughs> modernist and modernisms in our schools, from kindergarten to college, in our chancery offices, in our seminaries. Also, I would go after political dissenters mm. because mm. political dissenters what what they do, just like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, you have a lot of Catholics that are jumping over the trap door of hell because they say, well, Nancy Pelosi, she's pro-abortion, and mm -hmm. Joe Biden um, performs some homosexual marriages, and they go to communion every Sunday, and the Pope doesn't say nothing. Mm -hmm. What does that do? That, that breeds contempt for the church's teachings, and that breeds disrespect for the sacrament. You would, as a Pope, you would be doing the, the, the entire Catholic Church a favor by going after open dissenting politicians like popes used to do in times past. Mm -hmm. yeah. They would go after kings and princes and, and prime ministers, and they would have a face-off with them and say, you can't come to Mass anymore mm -hmm. until you repent yeah. of this. So that's the second thing I would do. The third thing I would do is is uh, promote the what, what the Church has basically told us to do for 2,000 years. The so promote the social kingship of Christ. What does that mean? That means that we want every person and every nation to know Jesus. And, and, and basically, that's the code of canon law. The last code of canon law, 1752, it says that keeping in mind the church's supreme law is the salvation of souls. Yeah. Canon yeah. 1752. That's what I would be doing as a pope right now. Yeah, that's the Great Commission. That's what Jesus told yeah. us. This is why the church is in, you know, in the business of saving souls. Well, <laughs> We've lost track. Pope, if I was a pope or a bishop, I wouldn't be talking about masks or vaccines <laughs> or social distancing. Yeah. I would be talking about how to get to heaven. Amen. I would be mm. preaching the gospel, and I would be dispensing the sacraments like crazy. Amen. Amen to that. that second number that you had there just reminded me of Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Talk about, you know, uh, separating the sheep from the goats, yep. really. Yeah. So your thoughts on Pope Francis? We get a <laughs> lot of questions on this guy. Um, Pope Francis is a product of his formation. Okay. So I'm going to be fair here. Yeah. He's from Argentina. He grew up in a socialist environment. Latin America is basically run by socialists, which yeah. is communism. Well, and some of the countries are communist. Bolivia, Venezuela, uh, Cuba. So some are communists. Uh, but Latin America is pretty much socialist. Hmm. That's what he grew up. Also in the 60s, the Jesuits, looking at a soft target, they saw the Hispanics... Latin Americans kind of as a soft target, not very deep intellectually. They're more urban people, you know, uh, I mean, ur rural people, uh, people that work with their hands in the agriculture. So they started setting up liberation theologies in their seminaries uh, uh, from, from Mexico all the way to the tip of South America. Back in the 60s, what is liberation theology? It's the amalgamation of Karl Marx's Marxism and the Catholic faith kind of slammed together in a hodgepodge to give us this new religion, which is again, uh, uh, it's 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 a uh, it, it's called syncretism. The yeah. Catholic Church can't be attached to anything else; it stands alone. And so, most of our Hispanic priests from Tijuana, which is Mexico, San Diego, to the end of South America, are malformed. Mm, yeah. I talk, I've been talking to them all my life. Mm. They're Marxists. You, you talk to them, they're social justice Marxists. Mm. They're, they're, they're more social workers. Pope Francis grew up in this. Pope Francis also, he says that his favorite teacher, as he was growing up through his formation, he says, there was a female communist teacher. He says, she affected me. She changed my life like nobody else. Mm. In fact, up until the second or third year as a Pope, they were still corresponding and calling each other. He said, she was my favorite teacher I ever had, a female communist. And he says, hmm. she, she, 
she had the, the biggest impression on my formation more than anybody else. Also, what else did Pope Francis see? Pope Francis saw dictators all around him. Hmm. Uh, you know, Perón, the, the dictator in Argentina. That, this is what Pope Francis saw all around him. And he saw the way dictators govern. They, they, they're all Latin American strongmen. You do what I say or I will kill you or I will throw you in jail. So Pope Francis is a product of bad liberation theology, Jesuit formation, mm -hmm. which started in the 60s. Okay, And then he's a problem, a product of he grew up in a communist socialist environment. Okay. Then he saw the leaders of these countries. They governed again like dictators, like strongmen. All of this has shaped his papacy. Hmm. He governs like a Latin American strongman. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Right. Look at his last document on the Latin Mass. Yeah, yeah. right. There's yeah. nothing fatherly or pastoral about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good and that's, point. That's the Peron way uh, of getting your message across. Because, again, that's what he saw all his life. So yeah. I'm not making excuses for him. I'm just describing who we have as the Bishop of Rome and what formed him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an objective view of it. I've, I've never... That's I mean, what I try to do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've not really thought of... I mean, like... I've, I've thought about it and kind of recognized, oh, well, the first Latin American pope, right? Mm -hmm, and yeah. um, and just wow. the socialistic... Uh, and in the papal travels, he, you get nervous because you're not sure what he's going to say or what he means behind things. He says good things, that's for sure. His most recent one, it was very like pro-life, maybe the most pro-life yeah. statement of a pope ever. But then there's other statements you're like, oh, well, what are, well, how are people taking that? What's the media doing with that? What are lukewarm Catholics doing with yeah. that? And then they just go. Yeah, he said abortion is murder, yeah. right? It's uh, like hiring a hitman. That's pretty darn strong. Yeah. Love it. That's great. And I'll tell you, I, I also think he, he's at fault. He should know better. Mm. And, and his handlers are at fault. What do I mean by that? Notice the last two popes in our lifetime. Because everybody knows they knew that all the cameras and the whole world is looking at them. Yeah. And so whenever they would make a statement, they would do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Teleprompter. Yep. <laughs> I hope that. Why? You know why? Because they know the whole world's looking at every word that they say. So they want to make sure that their T's are dotted, that their I's are dotted, their T's are crossed. Mm -hmm. And they're speaking according to the perennial teachings of the church mm -hmm. and not giving their an emotional opinion mm -hmm. that's going to be all over CNN and MSNBC tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But Pope Francis doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, that's his, uh, that's a defect on his part because that's typically the way Latin American politicians like to speak. Mm -hmm. You'll find again, kind of Caucasian European paper in front of you, state of the script, read the teleprompter, but not Latin Americans. They're, they're more emotional and off the cuff. Mm. And because he's seen that all his life, that's the way he's governing as a pope. And it's not good because a lot of his statements be, being made reflexively oftentimes are off the path of orthodoxy. I don't think he does it on purpose, mm. but you can't, I mean, when you're just, you're 80 years old and you're speaking off the cuff at an airplane, at an airport with reporters, you're not going to be as precise. He's not as sharp as he was when he was 50 or 40. Mm. He's the same so, age that John yeah, Paul II was when he died. That's why you need, that's why those popes had a paper in front of them. Yeah, yeah right. right. Hmm. It's very true. That makes a lot of sense. We have a paper in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just double checking. I mean, gosh. You guys aren't, you're not 80. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it's, man, it's it's unfortunate, though, you know. How do you? Well, I mean, we're the Rome boys. We love Rome. We love the papacy. We love the church. We love, <laughs> but this papacy has been a struggle. It really has. We have to defend our church when sometimes things are said. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, the Pope is a Jesuit. The Jesuits in Latin America are formed. All the seminaries they're formed was by what's called liberation theology. Mm -hmm. Liberation theology is basically Catholicism and Marxism slammed together, kind of in a, you know, and roll it up and see what comes out. And so you'll find that a lot of the Jesuits 
in Latin America, even here, but in Latin America, uh, their faith has been taken away from that vertical mm -hmm. that me and God get to heaven, salvation, be holy. And their faith as a result of liberation theology is now horizontal. Mm -hmm. How can I help the poor? How can I help the orphan? Not that that's bad, right. but what liberation theology does, it turns our priests into social workers, mm -hmm. not ambassadors of Christ. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because mm -hmm. in America, we have our own set of problems. And what we're seeing is a lot of, um, a lot of international priests here that are formed in these ways. I was very much, you know... Uh, uh, worked for it, okay here's what I'm trying to say there are some uh, uh, oh my there's, God. Well, I'll tell you Divine. there's a lot of there's a lot of male formed Hispanic priests in the United States because they've been trained in liberation theology mm -hmm. they get they petition to come over here and incarnate and they bring in their social justice liberation Marxist Catholicism into a, a parish that's what yeah. they do I've, I've seen it all my life yes. I've argued I've argued with Hispanic priests for 30 years, and I have I take their lunch money. I take their cookies. <laughs> I say, what you just said, Father, is wrong. And I'll say this. Lo que dijiste es no está correcto. You know? uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, they're, they're like, whoa, shoot. Who, this guy's a Hispanic. He knows the doctrines of the church. He knows the catechism. I think you need to go parish to parish <laughs> and make sure you get these guys in line. <laughs> yeah, you got That's your of, new ministry. <laughs> <laughs> and there's your apostolate, one by one. <laughs> it's, you know, uh, uh Let's get these priests back on the narrow path. I mean, if they're not on the right path, the flock will follow. They're, they're, gosh, I'm like... But, but you know what? The same things happen in our U.S. seminaries in the last 60 years. A lot of our U.S. seminaries, we have, we have the same thing going out. They're pumping out uh, modernist, hmm. Marxist dissenters, liberation theologians. It's happening. I mean, some seminaries are better than the other, but we got the same problems here. Mm -hmm. And then we, we found recently after the summer of shame that we also have a huge sexual predation problem yeah. within our within our seminaries and within the clergy well i was going i the word came to me it's order i've I, what i found is there are more priests uh, and bishops that are more beholden to their order than they are to rome uh, you know, to, to the canon, to the teachings of the church, mm -hmm. because yeah. their order often takes over an entire diocese. The bishop may be even of that order, and they stick together, and they have their own meetings, and it's not even a diocesan meeting, but it might be, but it's all of the same order, and so their mission that might work in another country mm -hmm. because of the needs of that country, be it, uh, you know, a third world country or uh, a, a country in wartime, whatever the case may be, it often doesn't work here in the United States, and I think that formation that you're talking about in these foreign or international orders, it's, I see it as a problem in the United States. They, uh, you know, you'll have these priests that do not understand their parishioners at all and the mm -hmm. troubles that they're going through. They're going to hear their confessions, true enough, but it's just not like Pope Francis, how they were formed. It's not their upbringing, mm -hmm. and I don't mean anything negative by it. Just right. like you were objective in your statement, I mean the same thing is true, mm -hmm. and I think they they sometimes struggle to connect with their parishioners and yeah i, I guess uh, they're from a different culture yeah they, yeah they, right on they don't they don't connect with an american that has you know the caucasian european roots they don't so shame uh, on us for not producing more priests in our own yeah, country yeah, it's right. our fault because it's, it comes it, back it's to the family doesn't it yep. shame mm -hmm. on us because of bad catholic families we're not mm -hmm. getting enough vocations out there mm -hmm. and also what doesn't help is let's just be honest our culture our culture yes. is run by Satan. When I talk about culture, music, movies, education, uh, you know, uh, everything that's happening around us, the, new, the newest fad on TikTok, that's culture. That has such a, a, a detrimental effect on young people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they'd rather be, you know, following, uh, uh, you know, Lady Gaga on TikTok <laughs> yeah. than spending time reading maybe the, a daily Bible reading or the, the daily rosary. Mm -hmm. So, Culture is used very powerly, powerfully by Satan to pull people away from having an authentic interior life. I got a question going back to the 1950s thing. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking advantage of talking to Jesse Romero. Yes, sir, <laughs> I'm just going to talk and ask questions. So you talked about the infiltration back in the 1950s of the communists and so forth into the seminaries. Uh, isn't it? I, I'm just going to ask, do you think there's any correlation with the Vatican II 
changes and maybe Pope Francis and his position on the traditional Latin Mass. You do, Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The infiltration into the Catholic Church actually started about 200 years ago, <laughs> and it started with the Freemasons. They were the first ones yeah. that they're, they're the more, they're the arch enemies of Catholicism, and they're the ones that sought to destroy the Catholic Church through infiltration. So the, the Masons uh, precede everybody. Then communism is born with the Bolshevik Revolution, Vladimir Lenin. So after World War I, Joseph Stalin, after the war, he starts commissioning communists to infiltrate Catholic seminaries in the United States. So that's the second infiltration. At this point, now we have, this is about the 1920s, Pope Pius X sees all this, St. Pius X. Mm -hmm. And so he writes the encyclical uh, on modernism. He writes an encyclical on mm -hmm. modernism. And in that encyclical, he's warning us about the infiltration into the church. So it already had happened. The communists had started, I mean, the Freemasons had started way before the communists, then the communists, and with the communist infiltration, they also, uh, Stalin told the communists to bring sexual degenerates into Catholic seminaries. Mm. And so, at the time of Vatican II, the 1960s, these three enemies, of the, these three poisonous doors that are already inside the church, the mystical body, and they're navigating themselves in chancery offices and schools and stuff. What happened in the 60s, because of the 60s was a, a, a chaotic time, the sexual revolution, you had the, uh, the Woodstock, uh, you know, uh, concert, four day concert of, you know, massive orgies and, and, and people just drunkenness. And that you also had the, the Stonewall homosexual riots. So the homosexual movement was born in the 60s as well. Uh, the Church of Satan was established in the 60s. Uh, you had the Satanic Bible was written in the 60s. Uh, I, the 60s was a, a, a horrible time in the country. That's when Vatican II was called, 62 to 65, in this incredible vortex of confusion with sex, drugs, rock and roll, wars, um, birth control, hmm. uh, the Church of Satan, the Satanic Bible, um, the Supreme Court legalizes uh, pornography and the big screen, uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, legalizes birth control, Griswold versus Connecticut, the homosexual riots are born, the homosexual movement is born into the country, 1970, Stonewall riots, uh, uh, 1968, the Woodstock uh, four-day festival, which is just basically a reflection of the country at that point. The Vietnam War, uh, uh, again, and the way, once again, it was fought in Washington, and we lost that war. The troops won the battles, but Washington fighting all the wars like they did this one that we just, they just gave it to the, the terrorists because they fought it from Washington. Uh this was the 60s. Vatican II was called in this time of social confusion. Well, guess what? There was already enough Marxist, modernists, and Masons, and, and liberation theology, theologians within the council. They saw this is our time to come out. I call Vatican II, this is when the modernists, kind of like a prostitute at a secular bachelor's party, hmm. they popped out of the cake. <laughs> At Vatican II, they said, it's safe now. Let's come out of the cake. Mm. This, the, the culture is ours. This, this culture of confusion and sexual pornification and, and this culture of dissent and anarchy, this is the perfect storm for us to implement and try to create a new church. And so that's what the modernists have been trying to do, create a new church. And again, Archbishop Vigano said not too long ago, he's not the only one that said it. He goes, you got two churches right now. Hmm. Uh, yeah, you got the, you got the church, uh, uh, you got what I would call the church that holds to the perennial teachings of the church. 
And then you have the Church of the Modernist that basically changes from one week to the next. Mm -hmm. Goodness gracious. That's definitely a good uh, perspective on that. And it's uh, so it's kind of like, uh, in, in my mind, a reference of, you know, you, you're a product of your environment. And so I guess we have to be really careful, huh, with our current environment the way it is and with our church and how delicate things are. Yeah, well, that, what's important is, is to know your faith, live your faith, and spread your faith. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, it's important, especially for men. Iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. Find like-minded Catholic men that want to get to heaven and want to be holy and guys that want to know their faith, not guys that are reading, you know, bazooka bubblegum uh, you know or, yeah. or marvel comics find serious guys that are cutting their teeth on church teaching and on the word of god hmm. the second thing we have to do as men uh fraternity uh, the second thing we have to do is have a life of of constancy constancy what i mean by that is prayer hmm. dedicated time of prayer morning midday and evening like the bible says in daniel chapter 6 verse 10 Daniel the prophet says he prayed three times a day on his knees facing Jerusalem, hmm. being a prisoner in Babylon. So as Catholic men, that's a good structure because guys need structure. Mm -hmm. okay? Most of us eat three times a day. Yep. We should be praying three times a day. And in that prayer of three times a day, you should be including the divine mercy and the rosary. Because things right now, right now, uh, we've got we've got to uh shoot fire off all the cannons that we can as catholic men from our soul because that's what prayer is mm -hmm. prayer has an offensive nature to it the bible calls prayer arrows being shot into the sky mm -hmm. well guess what that's exactly the way the ancient armies used to win wars they would get their archers and when the archers would unleash a thousand arrows into the sky game over for the other side mm -hmm. if they didn't put up their shields well again that's the effect of prayer Prayers called an arrow, and who's in the cosmos? Demons. Mm. Our prayers drive demons back, wound them, and torment them. And if Catholics only understood that theologically, especially Catholic men, that's what prayer does. It has an offensive nature. It torments, it tortures, and it wounds demons. Who says this? Tertullian, St. Cyprian of Carthage, mm. uh, Felix Minucius. Uh, I can quote you one exorcist after another. Mm. And... and, and so when I pray three times a day, I see I see arrows being shot from my from my mind, you know, mm -hmm. into the cosmos, and I see it doing an airstrike and taking demons down. Mm -hmm. that, that that imagination as I'm praying, Hail Mary, full of grace, as I'm seeing that or the divine mercy, it helps me stay focused because as a man, uh, if you tell tell a man, oh, when you pray the rosary. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a rose comes out of your mouth. That doesn't uh, do anything don't for work. me. Hey, that may work for my wife Anita. That's good. That doesn't work for yeah. me. Yeah. But when they, but when I know that my prayer is like an arrow that fires into the sky that that injures the enemy, I'm all over that. Yeah. Yes. And we got to make it to daily mass too, because I feel like I'm the only one with the little old ladies lots of times. Because yeah. I know that's the strongest prayer in the world, in Padre Pio, right? You know, nothing's greater than the sun is a mass. If you can get to daily mass, there's no excuse right. not to right. go. Right. I get it. Some guys work. Some people are going yes. to school. Um, guys that are like myself, re retired and stuff. Somebody, we can get there. We need to be going to mass as often as possible because once again. The Mass is the most powerful prayer that we have on, on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this interview has kind of been a little uh You've been listening a downer. to Joe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been a downer, man. I'm just like, it's like, it's dude, not, I'm depressed. Oh, don't be. I need, I need something I to build gonna, me up here. So I want to uh, ask this question. Uh, where is Christ working? Yes. Where, where the, where's the good stuff? I want to hear the, some of the right good here. stuff that's going on right now. Right here. Christ ah, is working. Amen. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, Christ is working with the lady right now like never before. Yeah. Fulton Sheen said it in 1972. He said, "Who's gonna?" He said that to the body of U.S. bishops. Think how popular that statement was. Yeah. Fulton Sheen said, "Who's gonna save our church? Not our bishops, not our priests, not our religious." He says, "It's you, the lay people. You lay people are gonna save the church." He says, "Lay people, tell your priests how to be priests. Tell your bishops how to be bishops." Here's what I. Here's what we hmm. should be thinking. We got to think micro, first of all. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I network with a lot of Catholic men here. We're involved in a lot of things, okay? We got guys, or teams of guys say, okay, you go to that abortion clinic, we'll go to that one. So that's a network of Catholic men. I'm just talking about Phoenix. 
Also, we got a network of Catholic men uh, that know their faith well that are that are running now for political office in different mm. districts because we want to influence the local elections. Mm, yeah. We can't do nothing about Washington, but we can affect the local elections. So we're getting a bunch of Catholic men and we're saturating all the little districts in, in Maricopa County, Phoenix, Arizona, and Catholics are running for office. And these are well-formed Catholic men. That's great. We, we, we also, again, we also tell Catholic men, we on Telegram on our phone, we got like 200 guys, uh, we, we remind them, morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer. So there's a Telegram message that's sent reminding everybody, your morning prayers, divine, divine mercy, rosary at night. And also amongst these Catholic men, we've had a lot of meetings amongst ourselves and we basically 200 of us or more, we vow in all the different parishes that we go to. We say, if anybody walks into the Catholic church showing, showing some type of hostility, every Catholic man is called to stand up, get in that guy's face and stand between that aggressor, the priest and the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. So again, Wow. We drill this into these guys, the 200 guys that are on the telegram with us. We're saying, remember our jobs. Uh, stay by the doors, back against the wall. Uh, and, and just, you know, keep keep your head on a swivel. Because we don't know these days, there's been 95 attacks against the Catholic Church right yeah. now. So, Gosh. as Catholic men, those are good things. Get a telegram thing going with Catholic men to remind them about prayer. And get on the send them prayers and stuff say these are good morning prayers these are good midday prayers remind cat also i tell catholic men on the telegram i said guys uh work out if you can at least walk three miles a day do something what have you got to get up and and, and and defend your wife in the street or your kids or your grandkids you know I love uh, you're, you're no good to, you're no good to anybody if you're 400 pounds mm -hmm. and you're on a wheelchair yeah because uh you know you've been eating bonbons and, and donuts all your life you know, we also have a responsibility to take care of our bodies because who knows? We may have to get physical one of these days to protect Holy Mother Church. Mm. Man. I okay, now you got me fired up. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, it, you actually just really um, sparked something. It, you know, we say be real, be bold, and be Catholic. Uh, that is That first phrase matters a lot to what we believe because mm -hmm. you are real. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people scared to be real. And I don't mean any offense to anybody, uh, but you can be bold and be saying the wrong thing potentially. I think sure. we got to quit worrying uh, about hurting people's feelings. Dead serious. <laughs> we got to be real. We have to be real. Um, yeah, you, you know what? It, it's if the truth hurts your feelings, mm -hmm. then maybe you need your feelings to be hurt. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I uh, think we've been tiptoeing around too many times and just letting people oh, just for the sake of political correctness right or whatever the case may be we're just tippy toeing around them too many times we're just yeah we need to call it like it is yeah both in the church and society i mean our bishops are doing that a lot <laughs> unfortunately just tiptoeing, just tiptoeing. Just tiptoeing around. Being politicians yeah. and yeah, yeah it's again true. jesus the salvation of souls is why the church exists yeah. yeah exactly no yeah that's it that's it that's the primary reason um and when the bishops do something good, I'll, I'll applaud them. Like yes. a Bishop Jose Gomez and, and, and Corleone, they wrote an op-ed yes. piece pushing back against uh, these revisionist historians saying that St. Junipero Serra was basically uh, a barbarian right. and, and, and just, you know, was, uh, was just a priest that would just uh, in, 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 into the collusion of torturing and, uh, and, and enslaving the indigenous Indians. Well, these two bishops fired back, yeah. and they wrote an op-ed piece on the Washington Post, and they we went that's on several. Good. That's good. See, yes. when they do stuff like that, I applaud them. That, yeah, that's right. a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, yeah. Now, what does it? What Mother Angelica say? You know, what what are you showing love when you tell somebody what they want to hear? Yeah. Or when you tell them the truth? Yeah. You know, yeah. Who, yeah. Who, yeah. Which one's yeah. loving you more? Well, look yeah. at how kids turn out when parents aren't, yeah. you know, real with them. Buddy, buddy, or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we're, yeah. But it's not, not strict and disciplining. Yes, mm -hmm. God's going to be just with us, right? Is He not? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, we're gonna if uh, if we die in a state of grace, we'll receive God's mercy. That's mm. His promise. Mm. If you don't die in a state of grace, and most people will not die in a state of grace, objectively speaking. Hmm. Most people will die in mortal sin. I'll prove it to you after I make the statement. Wow. And so if you die in mortal sin, you'll receive God's justice. He's going to give you exactly what you deserve. Ooh. Why do I why did I say most people will die in mortal sin? 
Every time you look at our Lord Jesus Christ talking the gospels about people going to heaven, he says it, not me. I'm just a messenger. Mm -hmm. Every time he talks about salvation, people going to heaven, he'll say things like in Matthew 22, um, many are called, many are called to heaven, few are chosen. Mm -hmm. Luke 13, he'll say, strive to enter heaven by the narrow gate because few people find it. But many people walk the wide road of perdition mm -hmm. uh, that leads to destruction. A hundred percent of the times that our Lord Jesus Christ talks about who's going to go to heaven, he says, few will go there. Mm. And that's what he says. Yep. Now, you go to the church fathers. Forget about the modern theologians, okay? I don't want to talk about no modern theologians, modern bishops. The church fathers, every single one of them categorically said the same thing. Mm. St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Athanasius, uh, uh, St. Anselm, St. Cyprian, all of them said, many people will be lost, few people will be saved. Mm -hmm. So, obvious, who's the one that's going to be saved? Um, uh, you could see, Jesus says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Mm -hmm. I can tell you guys listen to the voice of Christ. You guys care about the church. You guys care about the country. You guys Take the time to do a podcast and call yourselves Rome boys because you guys love God and you love his people. Amen. You hear his voice. Amen. That's what compels you to do that. And so God knows who are his. Who are his? Those that hear his voice. And when they hear his voice, like it says in the book of James, now, you know, you have, you have faith and works. Mm -hmm. Now that you say, okay, I hear his voice. I've got to do something. St. James the Apostle says in the epistle, he says, faith without works is dead. You know, yeah. it is like, uh, you know, it is like a soul without outside of the body. Right. And so, again, uh, you know who's God's, God's people, God's elect are those people, they're, a, they're drawn to the sacrament. They're drawn to mass. They're drawn to prayer. They're drawn to evangelization. You can see hmm. God all over that person. That's Amen. God's elect right there. Amen. Yes. Okay, now you made me feel good again. But <laughs> <laughs> well, at the same time, I'm going to confession tomorrow. Yeah. Because, yeah. No, you need to fire you up. Oh, my gosh. Because you know, we're weak, right? right? Anything could happen. So you're Fired up but convicted. And yeah, I think yeah. when you're talking, I'm thinking about, you know, from the scripture, uh, even the apostles didn't recognize Jesus. When did they? In the breaking of the bread. Amen. Right? And when the... Uh, the disciples that were following Jesus uh, were with him in John chapter 6, come in verse 65 and 66. Mm. Uh, he said, you know, this is confusing. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to understand this? And they left him, right? So it's all of this. And I suppose the answer is those people that believe in the real presence, those people on their knees in adoration chapels, yeah. those people bowing before our Lord and receiving the Eucharist humbly, there's your disciples. That's that narrow gate. Fire them up. Those are God's elect mm, right there. Yeah. Mm. They hear the voice of their shepherd, mm. and their shepherd knows them. Yeah. Those are God's elect. You, you, you nailed it, really. The God's elect are the Catholics that know that Jesus Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. Once you know that, mm. that's life-changing. Yeah, You'll it, never it, be the same amen. again. And you can't even act the same after you know that. Mm -hmm. Right. Know that Jesus Christ is a mile and a half down the street from me right yes. now. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. That, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we talked about we've talked a lot about the church being in crisis, and uh, our clergy and our higher ups are all, you know, we don't know who to trust and who not to. But why would we ever leave? We can't leave the church because we'd be leaving Jesus. You right. can't leave Jesus. Yeah. Right. And He's got this. The Holy Spirit has right. got this. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. Jesus. Is, Jesus is the church. Remember that Saint Paul teaches that in First Corinthians twelve, Colossians one eighteen. He says Christ is the head. The church is the body. Okay, so we're the body of Christ. He's the head. I'm a, I'm a Roman Catholic Christian, not because of any pope, Amen. not because Amen. of any bishop, not because of any priest. When I pray my daily rosary and my divine mercy, hmm. at the very bottom is the Son of God crucified on a cross. He's my Savior. Amen. He's my Lord. He's my salvation. Yeah. He's my everything. He's why I live and move and have my being. Amen. He died for me on the cross. Not Peter, not Paul, not Thomas, not Judas, not Mary Magdalene. He's the only unique Savior of the world. And so I tell Catholics, 
Keep your eyes on Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Mm. Look no further. Yeah, it's so interesting. Woo, there's it's some so hope for you, Joe. <laughs> we'll just end the show right there. Thanks. It's been great. Uh, it just fires me up, though, because so many people that are Protestants that I love talking with, I, they say all these things and, you know, sound very similar to what you just said. Just yes. keep your eyes on Jesus. And uh, yet, th you know, they may come at us and say things uh, like, uh, well, you believe in this and that and the other. Oh, you're, you don't understand what I believe. That's the right, problem. Right. But you won't also take the time to listen either and consider what I'm trying to say, you know? Uh, a lot of times also, we get that. Also something very important, uh, as I held up the rosary, in John 19, 27, when Jesus was at the cross dying for our sins, and he gives John to Our Lady and Our Lady to John, and in verse 27, it says this. It, it's about John the Apostle. It says, and, and that day... John took her, Mary, into his own home. Mm -hmm. So if you're a, a true disciple of Jesus, then you should be living John 19, 27. Yeah. A true disciple of Jesus takes Mary mm. into his own home. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yes. John 19, 27. Mm -hmm. All nations will call me blessed. Mm -hmm. They are took mm -hmm. us. I mean, mm -hmm. we could go on and on. I love yeah. it. That was awesome. Yeah. It's, it's so <laughs> true. Replay that one over and over and over <laughs> again. That was cool. The only person to be called full of grace in those exact terms. Right, uh, right. You know, completely full of grace, not used anywhere else in Scripture. Argue with it, please. She I leads us to her son. <laughs> Actually, two people are called full of grace. Huh. Jesus, John 1, 14, Mary, Luke 1, 26. Yeah. So only two people yeah. are called full of grace. The Son of God, duh, of course, yeah. <laughs> is mother. Yes. Everybody else, everybody else is called, uh, 2 Peter 3, 18, it says this, say, the first pope says, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all of us four, everybody on planet, all 7.5 billion people are called to grow in grace mm -hmm. because we're not full of grace. Mm -hmm. There's only two people that the Bible reveals are full of grace, and it's none of us in this room. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Uh, I like it because in that one, you could even... Uh, be talking with a solo scriptura person yeah. and say, what, what, it what is you in the Bible? It's only two, <laughs> two folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I do the social media stuff for, for Rome Boys. He does, it's and, true. And we, it's come, all we, we come across, uh, you know, rad trads and progressives and liberals and people that say they're a Pope Francis Catholic and a John Paul II Catholic and a Benedict and all these divisions. So everybody in our audience, you know. <laughs> I thought know, we were just is, Catholic. And exactly, exactly. Universal. So how does someone stay just an Orthodox Catholic and why do we have to have these labels but I tell you though I'm kind of afraid when somebody says a rad you know trad ca Catholic because they will come after you the, uh, our, the biggest persecution has become the rad trads persecution yeah, with um, the at, at, we, we should just uh, I'll tell you what we're actually called mm. okay St. Augustine was asked by the pagans back in the 4th century in Africa they said what are you he didn't say, I'm a Roman Catholic. Hmm. He didn't say, I'm a Catholic. Here's what he said. He said, I'm a Catholic Christian. Hmm. That's what he said. Hmm. So that's, that's the earliest identifier. This is St. Augustine. Now, across the other side of the world, in Spain, there was another saint, bishop called St. Passiani. He was also asked by the pagans in Spain in the fourth century as well. St. Augustine in Africa. They didn't know each other. Wow. So they asked Saint Passiani, so what are you, mm -hmm. the pagans in Spain? He said, I'm a Catholic Christian. So notice, mm. you have two bishops that never met across the one in Spain, one in Africa, yeah. and they're both asked by the pagans as Christianity is, is starting to come in into those countries, and they're asked, what are you? Both of them use the word Catholic Christian. Well, who put that word in their heart? Yeah. It was the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, t every time I've been asked for the last 25 years, just what are you? I say, I'm a Catholic Christian. Mm -hmm. They said, uh, I, I said, everything, I, I said, mm -hmm. that's the identifier that the earliest saints have given us. And I think St. Augustine says something like this. He says, uh, my, my first name is Catholic. My last name is Christian, or maybe it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. My yeah. surname is Christian. My first name is Catholic. Uh, and so those two go together. You can't separate them. 
And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you where it comes from, those titles that St. Passiani and St. Augustine gave us. In the book of Acts, I forget what chapter, I, I think it may be chapter 13, but it's in the book of Acts where it says for the first time that, uh, I think Acts chapter 9, um, for the first time it says in Antioch, uh, the followers of Christ were called Christians. Mm -hmm. I think it's Acts 9.26, I'll flip it. It says for the first time the followers of Christ were called Christians. Okay, this was in the book of Acts. This is around 70 AD. Okay. Peter's already dead. They have the second, they have the second bishop in Antioch. I forget his name. So the second bishop passes away in Antioch. The third bishop that's installed is called Ignatius. Ignatius of Antioch. Mm -hmm. Ignatius is the one that <laughs> he was a disciple of John the Apostle. Mm -hmm. Basically, John the Apostle dies around 96 AD. Ignatius in 107, that's what, like 11 years after, after his tutor, his Bible teacher, John the Apostle, dies, Bishop Ignatius of Antioch says, he says, uh, where, the, where the bishop is, there is Jesus Christ, and where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So notice what came out of Antioch. Out of Antioch came the name of our church right. in 107 AD. The Catholic Church. And out of Antioch in the Bible in 70 AD, in Acts 9.26, I think it is, uh, is where we were we were called the followers of Christ. Because we were called before that the way. Right. Followers right. of the way. It was in Acts 9 where we are now called for the first time Christians. So that came out of Antioch. The, the third bishop of Antioch, Ignatius, called the Church of Jesus Catholic. And so I think that's why Augustine and St. Passiani... Antioch is a very important place because those words came out of there. They put those words together and they said, I am a Catholic Christian. Mm -hmm. Both those words came out of Antioch. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's and this awesome. has been like a great history lesson. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this whole episode has just been a great reminder and uh, refresher of on our history here. This has been great. And we can't lose that title as Catholics of Christian, you know, that we believe in Jesus, that we are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, and we are loyal to his church. Yeah. Love it. The, the difference between Catholic evangelism and Protestant evangelism is both of us want to save lost sinners that are lost in darkness, but the Protestants will say, let me bring you Jesus, Jesus and once you accept them, well, you can pick whatever denomination you yes. want to go to, your choice, any, meeny, miny, mo. Where we, when we bring somebody into a relationship with Christ, we say, come now home to the church he established. So Protestantism turns goats into sheep, but they leave them without a shepherd. Because they say, go out there and pick whatever church suits your fancy. Or the Catholic church, we turn goats into sheep and we bring them to Jesus in the Eucharist where they encounter him. Yeah, amen. It's, oh, man. It's, <laughs> this has been great. <laughs> It really has. I've been just kind of just been soaking it all in this whole time. I know I've been quiet, but I've just been listening. This is providential, like, actually, man, because yeah. I feel like being Catholic Christians yeah, yeah. is we got to step it up. Who we are? Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. It's literally who we are. Right, mm -hmm. right. Catholic Christians. Thanks for pumping us up, Jesse. Yeah, <laughs> you got it, guys. You got it. Hey, anytime. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I hope we can do this again real soon. Maybe absolutely within a year instead of being a whole year away. I mean, no, why make it sooner? I don't know why. why I don't know why you guys wait a year. I mean, uh, <laughs> you've been a busy guy, so you know, we don't want to bother you too much. Wait, yeah. What you got going on next? You got a book? You got an event you're going to? What's up? Yeah, I'm taking off uh, for four days to Ohio. I'm going to do a four day parish mission. I'm leaving Saturday. I just came back from. Uh, where did I come back from? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where I'm at. What day is it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I got a, I got a, the, the, the next book that's coming out. I'm so excited about. Hmm. <sighs> Laid out. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's it's a book which is gonna lay out, and we don't know. I think the title maybe the title may be called Liberation Through Christ. It's gonna come out through ten. Uh, I'm writing it with two buddies of mine, Dr. Dan Schneider and Kyle Clement. What hmm. we're doing is we're it's we're taking the the best teachings of the church on healing deliverance and exorcism and it's going to be like a manual to walk lay people through basically self deliverance hmm. because 90 percent of people that are delivered from from the diabolical 90 percent of them are not ever delivered by a catholic priest or a session 90 percent self-deliver hmm. and they hmm. stumble into it and so Whoa. we're actually going to write the manual 
how to do it because I've been seeing people, I've been you know emailing people, do this, follow this for 90 days and you're going to break the diabolical stranglehold. They'll go, Jess, I did exactly what you said for 90 days and I have I don't hear those voices at night. Wow. I don't hear, my, my bed's not jumping up and down. I don't see those, in, those attacks, those things jumping on my bed, those 200 pound weights at night. It's gone. Wow. So, so we're, it's like, you know, like P90X for Catholic, you know, like work at work. Or what's yeah, yeah, Exodus? Yeah. Okay. It's an Exodus program for Catholic laity who are struggling with the diabolical using the tools of the church underneath. Of course, you got to be in a parish underneath the pastor. You can't be doing this on your own. You got to be under the guidance of the pastor. How to self deliver. I'm going to tell you uh, this book is going to be one of the best-selling books in the Catholic Church, because I don't know any Catholic. Every single Catholic wants to know. I want to know exactly what the church teaches so I can protect my family and myself and make sure I stay free from the diabolical. Or if a family member right now is diabolically afflicted, how do I reach out to them? They don't want to see a priest. They don't. They want nothing to do with the church. How can I begin to help them? You know, I have this wow. constant... Um thought in my head though you said it's going to be best selling in the catholic church where if somebody wants to be exercised where do they go yeah they go to the catholic church whether they're um, catholic christians or not so before you even made that statement i'm thinking like people outside the church sure. are going to flock after this if they're in this and bring thing. them home yep mm. if, if yeah. they have a chance to see it i wow. think it's gonna yeah let us know when it comes out that's yeah. awesome yeah uh yeah no i'll definitely let you guys know uh we're shooting for December, uh, you know, right before the New Year's, uh, and it's, we're close. We're close to to, to finalizing the, the manuscript. Praise God! Thanks about, for doing that. Right before Christmas would be good. <laughs> yeah, right. That was Christmas presents to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Or before Halloween. <laughs> yeah. right. Hey, yeah, that's right. Hey, if you need a Ford or something, or yeah, right. <laughs> Joe's all over it. <laughs> I'll, I'll call the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody will just fly. absolutely. You got it. <laughs> well, well, Jesse, thanks again for joining us once again, and we'll, again, we'll try to get to you before a year. Uh, maybe we'll just interview you on on when the book comes out. There you go. <laughs> That'd be good. All right. Yeah, and, and and here the last thing that I just want to just let you know let the audience know is as Catholics. Probably a couple of things that I would just recommend okay. is, uh, again, as Catholics, pray rosary every day. Um, don't make no excuses. That, that, that's bare minimum Catholicism. Live in a state of grace. Uh, make sure that, like St. John Bosco says, pick good Catholic friends that are going to push you to virtue, to a life of virtue, holy habits. Also, work out. You owe it to yourself, your family. Uh, you have no idea. You may have to put your body in the way of some attacker one day trying to attack a priest or some parishioner. So make sure you're doing some exercise. Uh, also, vest yourself with sacramentals, brown scapular, you know, the miraculous metal. Make sure you've got your, your Christian dog tags. Mm -hmm. And also, read your Bible every day. Don't make excuses. You can get the simple Magnificat and read the day. Say, say make the sign of the cross. Say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening, like your servants listening. And read the daily mass readings. It'll take you five to ten minutes and ask God what he wants to reveal to you as you read his word every single day. Awesome. Woo, I'm yeah. pumped, Jesse. Thank you. Yeah, Praise this be has God. been great. Thanks for <laughs> adding that in. And yes. I'm sure with our marvelous Joe here, we can make it simple and, and number these things for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's his, great advice that everybody needs to really jump on and yeah, do live on it. a regular basis mm -hmm. every day, every day. Thanks for your time. And if there's anything we can do to support you, let us know. We'll do it. No problem. Thanks a lot, yes, guys. Sir. We'll do it again. Enjoy right. your weekend. Thank you, Thank you Jesse. Well, let's, let, let, let's close with the St. Michael's Prayer. Amen. Amen. Let's do it. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense, our defense against, against, the against the wickedness and snares of the devil. devil. May God humbly pray. pray. And do thou, do thou Prince, Prince of the Heavenly Host, host by, the by the power of God, God cast, cast into hell Satan, Satan and all the evil spirits, spirits who prowl about, about the world, world seeking, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thanks again, Jesse. All right. Jesse. All right, all right in the meantime, be real. Be bold. Be Catholic. God bless. God bless. <laughs>